listening to PetLifeRadio.com. Hello! It's time for the animal party. I hope you brought your dogs. I hope you brought your cats. I hope you brought your first aid kits. Yeah, yeah, I'm saying that right. I hope you brought your first aid kits. In fact, if you've got animals or kids or just yourself and you like to do stuff or don't do stuff, even if you're just a wimp who never goes anywhere, you can always get a splinter. You can always get cut, get a bee sting, get into a problem somewhere. Now, if you have animals and kids, you're definitely going to need first aid kits in your car, in your home, where you work, where you play. And chances are, when stuff goes wrong, it's not going to be at the doctor's office. It's not going to be in the hospital parking lot, and it's not going to be at the walk-in clinic. It's going to be way out in the hiking trail, down at the lake, over by the ocean, somewhere maybe on a long weekend when everything's closed. That's when you're going to have problems, health problems that you need to tackle right away. And so today we're going to talk about pet first aid. We're going to talk about dogs and cats and pet first aid, and something exciting because in a couple of days you can take this course and be totally able to help your animals in need. But also, a couple more days, you can take this course and teach it. Get a job for yourself. Create a franchise. There's a lot going on here we'll be talking about today. But before we get to that, I just want to tell you about something in the news. And if you hear a dog barking in the background, that's because today is one of those rare days in the rainforest. The sun is shining. It's the second day in a row. And I just couldn't bring myself to lock myself inside to do the show. So I'm outside at Camp Good Dog, and there's showings going on. New customers coming to see the place. There's two border collies checking out the big dog pond. So the standard poodle mama dog with her litter is not too impressed with that. And she's barking her little head off. (laughs) And I had a choice. I could separate her from her puppies, bring her in the house, and have her be quiet. I don't really want to separate her from her puppies. Or I can let her bark her head off and show the world that she's protecting her puppies and show the puppies what you do when you're a little bit worried about something. And uh, the Border Collies could care less. They're about three acres away by now, completely ignoring her, having a great old time in the pond. So we won't worry about that. We'll try not to worry about little Miss Razzle Dazzle with her nose at a joint. Maybe at the commercial break I will bring her inside for a break. Okay, so we're going to be talking about dogs and cats getting hurt. I had a dog run through a bench once. I've had lots of cut paws and nicked ears. We're going to talk about that. But before we get to that, have you seen the news? Have you seen what's going on with the deer? Oh, man. The deer are turning vicious. Now, at first, it was just in the Kootenays, which is a part of Canada right along the U.S. border in in British Columbia. And there was... These deer were moving into town, 40, 50, 60 of them, and just attacking dogs mostly. But a woman got attacked, a man got attacked, a young boy got attacked, a bunch of people got attacked. Mostly dogs, though, like literally 30, 40 dogs. Some dogs put in the hospital, broken backs, and seriously attacked. Well, so they ended up finding a great solution. They hired a woman, a little bit older than me, it was nice to see, maybe a lot older than me even, with a couple of border collies, four. She works two at a time. And they're basically just trained to scatter the deer. And they go in anywhere and move them, move them, move them, move them, move them out of town, move them out of town. So it's working out great. But in other areas, we haven't figured that out yet. And there's been some terrible problems with the deer. A woman just recently got attacked in another part of BC and also in Alberta. And so they're putting out warnings all over this part of the U.S. and Canada and the Pacific Northwest. Stay away from the deer and be careful with your dogs. If your dog goes off and chases a doe, that's what they think is going on because it's not running season. It's the season where the does have their fawns. So the mamas are taking care of the babies. And for some reason, probably encroaching on territory, maybe short supply of resources due to fires and drought and flood. I don't know. But for some reason this year, there's conflict. And they feel the need to protect their babies from us. And it's getting out of hand. This one woman, was she had two dogs with her and it attacked the dogs or she thought it was going to. So she was trying to save her dogs, but really it was after her. And it attacked her. And the man next door rescued her as she was being pummeled by this deer, hit with all four legs. It was sort of lying, standing on top of her and she was lying on the ground. So it can be really serious. I know it almost sounds funny to think of Bambi attacking you, but they are very large, wild animals. So... Be careful of the deer. Usually this time of year I'm warning people about the bears. But we haven't had many problems with the bears this year. So watch out for the deer. (laughs) And I'll keep you posted on that on Animal Party. I'm going to be talking a little bit later about the Calgary Stampede and uh, something I enjoy. And uh, the Royals and what's going on with them. You'll probably remember way back when the Royals had their fancy, fancy wedding. I was joking about how many security 
dogs does it take to keep a princess safe? And you can listen to that show. But back then, I had seven standard poodle puppies born that day. All reds, all beautiful. Six are ready to go to new homes next week. One's already spoken for. Uh, Boys and girls. So if you want to see them being born, if you want to see a real live birth video, talk about first aid kit. Anyway, want to see a real live birth video, check out DebraWolfOnline.com. You can subscribe for free and get the new sheet that's no ads, one page each month. You can get the blogs. You can get all my new pet radio and links to everything cool that I'm doing and all the things I'm doing with dogs and cats and animals as I have some great opportunities. You'll see photos of manatee and eagle and all kinds of eagles and seals and just animals you just probably have never got close to yourself, but you'll see me there getting close to them for you and telling you all about it. So, plus there's lots of dogs and cats, including things like this live birth, which is just amazing. I'm so happy I got it on film. The hardest part of it was the filming, because <laughs> I've been a midwife for dogs many times, but I never had tried to film it. Well, actually, one time I did, and it didn't work. This is the first successful filming of a live birth at Camp Good Dog, and um, if you're looking for a puppy, just give us a call. So right now, we're going to cut away to Lisa Wagner and find out about first aid, and the first thing I'm going to ask her is, well, how did you get into this in the first place? Was it a bad accident, Lisa? Originally, I was a student in pet first aid because I had a dog walking business. And yes, Mm -hmm. I had a serious accident about a month after I took the course. I had a dog run through the woods and slice his stomach across from one side to the next. And fortunately, he made it. I felt very proud of myself. He made it. I got him out to the vet. And uh, as I grew my dog walking business, I wanted to put my staff through the program and, and decided to become an instructor instead of putting them through with somebody else. So slashed. Bleeding? Where were you? I was in Pacific Spirit Regional Park, which is in Vancouver, B.C., and it's right in the city, but it is an actual forest. And I've always felt before then very safe in there, never really worried about that I didn't have access to veterinary care because Vancouver is a big city and I thought I would be able to head off to a vet. But what I didn't think about is once you really get into those trails and you're out on a walk, how are you going to get this animal out to the vet? An ambulance doesn't come to me to take the animal uh, out to the vet. I had to pick him up and physically carry him out. And that's what made me realize the importance of having the first aid skills if you are going to be out and about in the world with your animals. Yeah, that makes sense to me. That makes total sense. Because when I think of that park, I mean, yeah, if a human got injured, the 911, they would go into him. There would be guys with stretchers and somehow they'd get a helicopter, they'd get bikes, they'd get some way in there but they're not going to do that for the dog or the cat. you got to get out, back to your vehicle to get help. And carrying a dog, I remember once I had this dog, Michael Wolf Cross, and we were running near Stanley Park, downtown Vancouver, and he somehow cut his paw. The ditches were full of water. It was in the spring, but things were still wet. There must have been broken glass. And I just can't stand it when I see people crashing bottles downtown because don't they know that just hurts the babies, the children, and the animals, the only people and things sweet enough to go barefoot. I mean, the rest of us, hardened adults, wear shoes. Who are they hurting when they do that? Makes me so angry. But anyway, so this dog had a big chunk of glass in his foot, and I thought, well, do I pull it out? Do I leave it in? It was a mess. It was just his paw was just cut open with these chunks, and I ended up having to pick him up, and he was at least 75 pounds, probably more, and I was carrying him, and I still have that injury right down my shoulder blade. I can still feel it. I still feel those Mm -hmm. knots right behind my shoulder blade and all the muscles, and yeah, we made it out. We made it all the way to Denman Street. My car was parked a little further from there, and as I was running along Starbucks carrying this dog, now lucky for me, I didn't have any others. I was a dog walker way back when, but this was just my own Mm -hmm. personal dog. I was running along the street, and this man signaled me over and I said I can't stop now and I was like (gasps) you know and he said put the dog down here and he said it with such authority that I just did I threw this 75 pound dog down on the Starbucks table outside the cafe at Denman Street (laughs) and this guy goes to his truck and he opens it up and there's this enormous tackle box he's got Alberta license plates speaking of the Calgary stampede and he opens up this enormous toolbox 
and it's full of vet equipment. The guy's a oh veterinarian. My <laughs> like, it's like my prayers are answered. He opens it up. He goes, stand aside. I'm like, yes, sir. You know, and I'm just like breathing, breathing. People are getting me water. Everybody else is standing around. And in, in seconds, he has a thing, you know, doused with antiseptic. He's got the glass out. He stitched it all up. Mike is being held by a bunch of other people. Mike's so cool. He didn't bite anybody. But, you know, I was ready in case I, you know. But again, you need to be able to make a muzzle. Now, I can do that out of two elastics that I use for my ponytail. Can everybody listening? Probably not. So they need to have that in their first aid kit. And there's a few other things that your course warns them about. Because if you're not set up and you don't happen to luck into the veterinarian sitting at the cafe, <laughs> then you got to stop the bleeding. And you got to get the animal stabilized. And you got to figure out a way to carry it, which might be with a blanket used as a stretcher. But that won't help you if you don't have a blanket in your first aid kit. Right? So let's talk a little bit about that. What would you put in your first aid kit? Lisa? I would say the most important item to have in a first aid kit is lots of gauze. Uh, most kits come with gauze, but there's just not enough. If you have a real serious bleeding wound, there's not enough in there to contain the blood. The other thing is some pets like yours are big, so the gauze only wraps around them a couple of times, and that's pretty flimsy, you know? Oh, the yeah. other thing that I, I suggest adding into a kit is sanitary napkins, otherwise known as maxi pads, because they're clean, they're large, they're meant to absorb blood. They're a great idea. Um, they're individually the, wrapped, they're adhesive. There's a lot of pluses to that. I love that idea. Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, this is something else you might not have thought of, a whistle. If you're out in the woods and you're yelling and screaming, you're going to lose your voice. But blowing a whistle, you can do that for a long time and people will hear you really far away. That's a great idea to have for bears anyway. It's a good idea to have for your dog. I mean, there's a lot of reasons. Your cell phone may not work where you're going. So right. don't count on that. And a magazine rolled up in your first aid kit is really good because for the big dogs, if you need to make a splint, it works great. Exactly. I think razor is necessary, right? What do you got a really hairy dog and you can't even tell if it's him bleeding or somebody else? I mean, sometimes you can't find where the blood is. They shake their head and it's everywhere, right? So you kind of need to shave. Exactly. And some kind of first aid reference guide to you, whether it's just a little page that you print up for yourself with some basic kits or one that you've purchased from somewhere, but some kind of pet first aid reference guide so that if you freeze in that moment, you can refer to it and say, oh yeah, right, that's what I need to do in this moment. Okay. Now, when you talk about a first aid kit, I would suggest to people to go out and buy one that's already made up for people and then add a bunch of stuff. So add more bandages, more gauze, more things like your daughter's old tights, because those will keep a bandage on. Think your old nylons, things like that that'll keep it on. Old socks, this is your use for it now. And, um, and probably the next time you're at your vet, ask him, if my dog or cat gets stung by a bee, what is the proper dose of what over-the-counter medicine to give him before I get him here? Because if you get into a terrible allergic reaction, you don't want to be guessing. You don't want to be going by your neighbor's friend's dog had a chlorotriplon. Well, my cat's half the size or twice as old. Or, you know, ask your vet, find out what medicine he recommends and in what dose, and then have that in the kit with a little note that specifies that. Uh, that's important too. Okay, so when we get back, we're going to find out what you learn about in pet first aid and how you can take the course. And oh, we're just going to talk more about this, Lisa. So stay tuned, everybody, to the Animal Party on Pet Life Radio with your hostess, Deborah Wolf. Because the best is yet to come. Stick around. Buster, you're telling me my dog food products can't go on your shelves? That's right. Didn't pass one of my Petco certified nutrition checklists. Sorry, Wayne. Who made these checklists? Geniuses. Very smart guys. Well, it's good enough for most grocery stores. Do you see cheese puffs on my shelves? Mayonnaise? Soda pop? No. That's because I ain't running no grocery store, Wayne. Your pets will get better nutrition. I guarantee it. Petco. Where the healthy pets go. Enter the code PARTY10, P-A-R-T-Y, the number 10, and get 10% off any order. No minimum at Petco.com. I play tennis because I love to. But inside, I want to win. Take away the court, the net. I might not be a player, but I'll always be a competitor. Lady Foot Locker understands that. Lady Foot Locker, the first to carry Adidas off-court shoes and the gear that goes with them. If you play your best, there's no regret. Lady Foot Locker, one place, every woman. 
go to LadyFootLocker.com and enter the code AFAP10LF to get 10% off any order of $50 or more. Or enter the code AFAP15LF to get 15% off any order of $75 or more at LadyFootLocker.com. How would you like your business to reach out and invite in our audience? We have a brand new trademark concept called Info Seeds. Info Seeds are short 20 second seeds of information about your place of business, practice, or service. Is the best, most cost effective way to invite us in. We only have a limited number of slots left. For more information, visit the website PetLifeRadio.com. Click on sponsorship information. There you can listen to a sample of Info Seed. Remember, only a limited number of opportunities. Opportunities are available. Hi, everybody. I'm Megan Blake here with my sidekick, Super Smiley. <laughs> the giant mutt and spokes dog for throwaways. You're listening to Pet Life Radio, and I'd like to tell you about our brand new show, A Super Smiley Adventure. Our show explores adventures with animals. They can be traveling, out in the world trips, or inner journeys where our animals lead us to inspiration and self discovery, or just plain fun adventures. Join us here on Pet Life Radio on a super smiley adventure. Good boy. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. You're you're inside the VIP room. With the hottest party in town. Back to the party. Let's go. Hello. We're back with Animal Party. We are. We're having a party, a safe party, with our bandages and our magazine splints and our chlorotriplon and our razor and our muzzle. Now, even if you think your dog's really sweet or your cat is really lovey, when your cat has a broken arm or something sticking out of its head like a porcupine quill, it's not going to be lovey. So, (laughs) and if you need three people to hold it down to pull something out, you need a muzzle. Right? I mean, it's the only humane way to deal with it. You don't want to be dealing with behavioral issues when your animal's out of its mind with pain. It's not, it's not the time. You just need to muzzle it and get that quill out. Muzzle it and get that bleeding stopped. Muzzle it and get that dog or cat to the vet. So you need a muzzle that fits ahead of time in that first aid kit, too. I don't think we mentioned that, but you definitely need one. So, Lisa, what did we learn at your first aid course? I noticed, I thought it was funny, but I noticed people are allowed to bring their dogs. So, If your dog's really tolerant and doesn't mind being a patient, I guess you get to bring your dog to the class. That's really funny. The dogs are absolutely hysterical in the classes. They are so humble once they have these bandages on, just humiliated. But at the same time, it really (laughs) does add to the experience because stuffed animals are way too cooperative. (laughs) So as soon as we add a live dog to the mix and they start kind of pawing at it or wiggling around, that's what's going to happen in real life. And you mentioned having a muzzle. That is absolutely critical. The biggest two differences between pets and people in first aid are, you already mentioned one, they're very hairy. And number two, people don't typically bite in a first aid emergency. So, yeah, the, the, <laughs> now I'm thinking, lies. yeah, well, it depends on the person <laughs> because I've seen some really hairy people and I know they often talk <laughs> with them down when they're going into maternity because I think we'd bite. But yeah, no, I'm getting you. Animals are out of their mind and you can't reason with them and you don't even want to. It's not fair to them exactly. in that situation to be scolding, right? I mean, it, it's not the time. So in the classes, we obviously cover emergency first aid. So for the the issues that you were talking about, these things, lost stings, bleeding wounds, choking skills, CPR, all of those skills are covered in the course. But our course also has a, a very strong emphasis on prevention of illness and injury and also early detection because these are the the points that are so key in avoiding a lot of these emergencies from ever happening. So... I just want to ask you, uh, you mentioned CPR briefly, and I want to go back to that a bit because I've taken courses in human first aid when I was learning swimming classes as a kid and lifeguarding, but also later uh, pet first aid courses. And I don't remember ever doing CPR on anybody, human or dog, live because I think you crack their ribs. I think there's danger, right? So how do you teach CPR without, without hurting the, the participants? That is a very important question. 
we do not use the live pets to teach CPR because it can be very, very dangerous for them to have us pushing so hard on their rib cage, and also it interferes with their natural heartbeat. So right. we show people on the live pets the location where they would be doing CPR, and then they will either practice on a stuffed animal or use a CPR mannequin, and both dog and cat CPR mannequins are available now, and they work very similar to the human mannequins where the participant can actually push quite deeply into the chest as though they were doing real-life CPR, and they can also breathe into the, in animals, we breathe into the nose for the airway portion, so they can actually breathe into the nose of that mannequin and watch the chest rise. Okay. Yeah, I've seen CPR in animals and AR. I've never had to do it except in conjunction with puppies being born because sometimes you do have to clear their airway and sometimes you have to get them breathing when they're, when they're first born. But I've never had to do it with an adult dog. I, I want to knock on wood. There's no wood near me. I'm knocking on plastic. Okay, that's not good enough. There, I found wood. I don't want that to happen. But that's the thing. I mean, you never plan for these emergencies. I told you once about this dog, Chopper. And Chopper was this really intense Rottweiler. He was a rescue dog, and people had mistreated him a lot. And he thought if you threw something at him, it was going to be a rock, because that's what they used to do. They used to hit him with a pipe or throw rocks at him to get him away from the gate so they could slide his food in. And so when I first started working with him, I was trying to teach him about balls, and I would juggle, and then accidentally, so to speak, I mean on purpose, but for his mind, accidentally let one fall into his pen. And at first he would cower, and then he'd go investigate it, and then he'd figure out it was harmless. And after a while, he started to play with balls and play with balls. Well... He grew to really, really love balls. It became his obsession. And later, when he was much better trained and reliable with people, I used to take him to off-leash dog parks like Trout Lake. And in order to make people not afraid of this big, rotty coonhound cross that would come barreling along, I taught him to bring his ball to people. So he would run up to people and drop his ball and sit. And no one was ever afraid of him. People called him Carl after this children's book hero, this Rottweiler. And people just loved Chopper because he was just so obviously interested in the ball and nothing else. And everybody was cool with that. So, but he, would, he had this knack for finding the man with the strongest arm. And so one day, which, you know, when I was single wasn't such a bad thing. But anyway, one day he found this guy who was really hucking the ball for his dog. Oh, I mean, really throwing it out there. So he dropped his ball for this guy. He sat down, did his thing, lifted his ball, you know, the whole thing. And the guy hucked this ball so, so far, and it went right over a bench, a park bench. And Chopper was just a very direct kind of guy. So he didn't go around and he didn't go over. He went through the bench. And part of the bench was in his chest and part of the bench was coming out somewhere behind his ribs. And he came back with the ball and he's all happy. <laughs> and he tries to sit down. He can't sit down, but he's standing there with the ball and he's dropping it. And there's blood dripping slowly, but still. Piece of the bench in one end, piece of the bench coming out, three spokes in each side. And I'm thinking, oh no, this is bad. Now I have a whole bunch of dogs. I corral them all up. I get him. I get in the car. I drive to the vet clinic. Open up. I get in there. And the, the road, it's just like the, it's, the clinic is full and everybody just parts, you know, because this gigantic tough dog with a piece of furniture in his belly comes walking in the door and it's like, okay, go ahead, go ahead. So we go ahead. But that was a lucky situation. I probably wouldn't have had, oh, and this is the thing we missed on your first aid kit. I probably wouldn't have had the, the uh, pliers or wire cutters or sharp, sharp scissors that I know your course recommends. Had I had to cut that thing out and deal with it myself, I probably couldn't have dealt with it myself. It was too big for me. And, you know, maybe taking your course every few years is, is what people like me ought to do, people who work with pets. So is that the kind of person who's in your course, people who work with pets? Yeah, probably about 70% of people who come through our program are either working with animals or aspire to. So we get a lot of dog walkers, dog daycare owners, kennel owners, um, groomers who like to come through our programs. But I would say that the other 30% are the die-hard pet lovers who just want to be there in the event that something goes awry like that. What happened to you, it's a once-in-a-lifetime event, but that's all that it takes is once-in-a-lifetime, you know. And so these people come through the program just in case that does happen. If people are listening now, and this show broadcasts all over the world, so people are probably listening in areas where the course isn't offered, but they're probably listening in areas where they could get to the course as it's offered today, how do they log on and figure this out? Because I know you're looking to expand, and all it takes is like a weekend, and you're a graduate of the course, you can put the pet first aid certificate on your wall, and you're, you're able to deal with emergencies. But if you want to go one up from that, you could take two weekends out of your life 
And now you're one of the instructors, and maybe you want to set up something like this in your area. I know you're looking for that, right, Lisa? So how do they find out how to get in touch with you about things like this? So people can either log online and contact us. Our website is walksnwags.com, or they can also find us on Facebook. They can also call our 1-800 number, which is 1-800-298-1152, and we can give you all the information that you need. Right now, we have a number of courses being offered across Canada, and we are actively looking to expand into the U.S. Anybody who is in the U.S. that's listening, we do have a very comprehensive distance learning package, so you can contact us or look onto our website to learn about that. Well, now that's for people who are already in this, right? Like if you're a nurse, if you're a vet tech, if you're a dental hygienist, or anybody who's had any first aid and medical training whatsoever, that's for you, right, if you don't want to make the travel. Yeah, for the initial course, the provider level course, just to become certified in pet first aid, that mm-hmm. can be done by anybody via distance learning. But for to become an instructor, you do have to attend in class unless you meet the criteria that you just mentioned. If somebody has a really extensive medical background or first right. aid background, then we can look at putting them through to become an instructor via distance. And that's the kind of person who might be really good at this. They might end up really liking this as a career choice. I could totally see it. I know you said that people have met in your course. And uh, in one case, uh, one participant got a job from another participant. So one participant obviously found the employee he was looking for, and the other one found his new boss. So that's kind of cool. I could see this being a great dating avenue. Because if you're single and you love your pets and you go to this thing, there's going to be other single people there who love their pets. And you can't help but come out of your shell in an environment like this. You got to touch them. You got to talk to your pet the way you really talk to them because you got to make him tolerate getting bandaged and, and all kinds of other stuff. And even if you're a cat lover and you didn't bring your cat, I mean, you're going to be working with someone else's dog. You're going to be sitting on the floor. You're going to be doing things in a group. This is a perfect way to make new friends and maybe, you know, date, wouldn't you say? It is. You know, I don't know for sure if we've ever had a love match come out of this. I think I'm going to email our instructors and find out because you've got me. <laughs> That's a good topic. But, uh, the networking in these courses is phenomenal. And the friendships that have been made and the business contacts and just getting to know other people in the community that are like-minded, that definitely is a big plus in the classes. Well, you know what? I think I'm going to set you up because I've been working on a, in the future I'm having on the show for an interview, a dating site that is just for people with pets. So you log on and you see the other person and their dogs and the cats and you decide, yeah, okay, I'm not really a cat person. I don't like that guy. Or, oh, yeah, what a beautiful cat. Oh, yeah, that's my kind of guy. You know, that kind of thing. It's quite a funny. It's an interesting way to do things because, really, you avoid all the issues of he hates my pets, I hate his pets, my pets don't like, you know, all that stuff. You're with a confirmed pet owner. But I'm thinking maybe you should offer one of those events. You know how they do events? They, they'll go to like a bar. Or that. You should offer a pet first aid course to these pet lover match people. Then you'll up your staff, right. I think. <laughs> yeah, you have to be single to attend kind of thing. Hmm. <laughs> exactly. Maybe do it around yeah. Valentine's Day. That'd be fun, you know. For all the people who don't have a Valentine, bring their pet Valentine to the pet first aid course. Bingo. There you go. There you go. That would have been good for me because my husband is not an animal lover at all. <laughs> uh oh, things don't there go. There you go. Well. <laughs> See, when I was dating, I would look, and if the guy had no hair on him, no dog hair, no cat hair, nothing on his suit, nothing on his clothes, nothing anywhere, no sign of animal life anywhere, then I was pretty much out of there. Because, you know, I mean, he had, even if he didn't live with them, he had to at least have enough contact to pet one when he saw one in his day, you know? I just. We don't want to deal with the animals. They're not my people. They're not invited to this party at Animal Party on Pet Life Radio. So we should break for another commercial. We'll be back in a minute to Pet Life Radio. Don't leave this party before it's over because the best is yet to come. Only losers leave the party early anyway. Party on. Back in a few. Love your pets but wish their medications were a lot less expensive? They are at 1-800-PET-MEDS. You'll not only save on flea and heartworm medications, but on prescriptions for arthritis, incontinence, thyroid, and more. And you get fast service, free shipping, and a 100% satisfaction guarantee. Plus, our licensed pharmacists ensure accuracy, monitor drug interaction, and more. See why over 5 million people have trusted their pet's health to 1-800-PET-MEDS, America's largest pet pharmacy. Call now or order online. 
go to PetMeds.com forward slash party, P-A-R-T-Y, to get 10% off any order and free shipping on orders of $39 or more. Whether they're big, small, hairy, or whatever, you're going to need gear for your feet. And Kids Foot Locker's got all the great shoes and gear that'll get you in the game. Go to kidsfootlocker.com and enter the code AFAP10KF to get 10% off any order of $50 or more. Or enter the code AFAP15KF to get 15% off any order of $75 or more at kidsfootlocker.com. And cover those funky feet. FTD's network of over 40,000 florists around the world have been creating beautiful handcrafted arrangements for 100 years. Each arrangement is delivered the same day and backed by FTD's seven-day satisfaction guarantee. For a century, people have trusted their most important occasions to the flower experts at FTD. Since Pet Life Radio is all about puppy dogs and flowers, our listeners, that's you, can get a 20% discount on your order. Just go to florop.com and use the code LUCKYS20 at checkout. F-L-E-U-R-O-P.com. Code word L-U-C-K-Y-S and the number 20. Pets can be a wonderful addition to your life. Because they're a member of the family. Keeping them healthy and happy is important. Pet Life Radio presents The Pet Doctor with veterinary media consultant and veterinarian Dr. Bernadine Cruz. Whether you have a dog, cat, reptile, or rabbit, you'll find answers for your pets straight from the vets. The Pet Doctor, on demand every week, only on PetLifeRadio.com. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. You're, you're, you're inside the VIP room. With the hottest party in town. Back to the party. Let's go. Hello. We're back at the animal party on Pet Life Radio. I told you about those standard poodle puppies that were born. All seven of them healthy and strong. One or two did need help, though. I had to cut the sack in one case. I had to help one breathe in another. There were some issues, but I was right there with my kit of clean, sterile things all ready to go. And with the mother's help, of course, she does almost all the work. She's a good mama. But that all happened on the royal wedding day. The royals, April 29th, I think it was. And... Um, Speaking of the royals, they're coming to Canada, the young couple, Will and Kate, and everybody's all excited, and in some places, there's going to be more people going there than are normally resident, in the, like in PEI. Apparently, there's more people coming to see them than are resident there all year long, so it's going to be record crowds and all kinds of fuss for them, and um, here I have my seven red poodles, all named after food and royalty, so we have Strawberry Kate. And we have <laughs> we have different ones. What was George? I got to remember what George was. Paprika George? No, that wasn't right. Paprika was one of the girls. Anyway, my kids gave them each a food name that had something to do with their color, red, and a royal name that had something to do with Diana and Will and Kate and everybody in the party, seven of them. So that's the litter that's available now. But if you want to see it being born, go to DeborahWolfOnline.com and uh you can subscribe there for free, and that just gives you a window into the pet world, and it helps me out a lot, too. So join my pack. Join it there at DeborahWolfOnline.com. Costs you nothing. I won't inundate you with junk mail. In fact, we might even have a, a prize going out once in a while and some freebie offers for you. But there's always DVDs, clips, and movies, and all kinds of fun stuff to look at. Things like the live birth, but bloopers, too. Great stuff there. And it is kid-friendly. So, okay. Now you might want to watch the live birth first before you decide if your kids are old enough to see it. Some of it is, is very, very real. So you decide. Watch it first. And that's probably true even when you get to sites that say they're kid-friendly or for kids. You should always check it out first because everybody's estimation of what their kids are ready for is different. If your kid is already afraid of blood, then probably it's not a good one for you. But if your kid is really curious about biology and um, fascinated by this kind of stuff, my kids watch as the puppies are being born. And I'll often let them hold one or two while the next ones come. So, you know, my kids 
who are only six and eight and have been doing this for years are very happy with it. <laughs> but, you know, it's all a personal choice. So I wanted to tell you about the Royals because they have been getting a lot of grief about going to the Calgary Stampede. Animal activists all over the world are trying to persuade them not to go, and they are holding their ground. They are saying, no, we are going, period. And people are all surprised about that. Oh, Will and Kate, it's so popular. How can they go to the Calgary Stampede when world opinion is against things like calf roping and all the things that involve baby animals, really, and many of the things that are high, highly injurious, so have a high risk of injury at the Stampede, are being boycotted. And some places they've been boycotted successfully to the point where a uh, rodeo here in Vancouver, the Cloverdale Rodeo, has been scaled down and the most dangerous events and the events involving baby animals have been eliminated. So it's an interesting issue, and it's very, uh, very much a hot topic. And for them to go to one of the biggest, well, the biggest rodeo in North America and uh, is like saying their blessing on it. Now, is it a surprise? I got a bunch of emails asking me, do you think it's a surprise, and could you comment on your show? Well, to me, it's not a surprise, and I'm not even disappointed in them. There's a lot of rights and wrongs in all this. And are you really vegan vegetarian? Do you really never wear leather? Do you really have no use at all for animals in any way that's exploitive? Because if you are, and you do, and all that's true, then maybe, maybe you can condemn them for this. But most of us are somewhere along the scale. Most of us are eating some meat or wearing some leather or doing something, maybe using oil or a foreign car or a big car or, you know, something that isn't ideal. And so what are they into? Well, the royals are pretty consistent. They're into hunting. They're into fox hunting. They're into horses. They're into fishing. They're into big game hunting. I mean, they're, Prince Charles is definitely pro-environment and one of the world's leading advocates protecting the environment. But he's not one to turn down an opportunity for a good hunting experience. So there's a lot of ways to look at this. And, you know, if you do eat meat, well, do you really condemn the hunter who eats what he kills and only kills what he needs? Because I don't. Something to think about today on Animal Party with Pet Life Radio. Okay, so we're back with Lisa, and we're talking about pet first aid. And um, I just want to know, what makes this so different? You know, if someone's listening and they think, well, I've already taken first aid for people, and I kind of know the basic anatomy of a dog. I think I can wing it. Why is that not quite right? Pets are pretty different from people. One of the biggest issues is they stand on four legs. So, for example, if I had broken ribs, I could still stand up. If a pet had broken ribs, it would be very unlikely that they could still stand up. Also, a lot of issues that happen with pets, we can't actually see. So a pet gets hit by a car and they're lying there and you don't actually know what's going on with them. So having more of a background on actual signs, symptoms, how to stabilize an animal and how to transfer it to them to the vet is, is very important. And then like you and I already mentioned, pets, you know, it's very likely an injured pet if it cannot run away will try to protect itself if it's in pain and you are touching it. So we have to know how to actually safely approach an animal, uh, gain their trust, and then safely restrain them, which is also quite different from people. So just having more of a, a knowledge and a background on pets as a whole and how they think and how they react, as well as having the emergency skills, can have a lot more of a successful outcome in these kinds of accidents. I think some of it, too, is the size. You know, we tend to be heavy-handed because even if we think about saving an 8 or 10 or 12-year-old, that's a really big person compared to a chihuahua or a cat or a medium schnauzer. You know, and just knowing where stuff's supposed to be and how hard to press and where to touch and how tight do you wrap a bandage to stop the bleeding without cutting off the circulation on a toy poodle. I mean, how are you going to know that if you haven't taken this course? You're not going to know that. They're the same with temperatures and what's normal, what's not normal, what's dangerously not normal, and what's, you know what, we can call the vet and make an appointment. That is a critical thing that I get called all the time by my staff for what they think is a 911 emergency, and really, it's not. You know, the dog Mm -hmm. has been chewing too much on a ball, and its mouth is bleeding, and if you take the ball away, the mouth stops bleeding, and the dog is fine. They think i got to rush this dog to the vet because its mouth is bleeding, and oh my God, it must have an ulcer, and you know, (laughs) things can get really out of hand if people don't have basic first aid. And, you know, that's mostly the the teenagers when they first start here. They learn so much when they work at Camp Good Dog. But, you know, a nicked ear, it might require going to the vet, but it might not. And if you take this course, you could be saving yourself a lot of money, really. 
Definitely. That's one of the biggest reasons that when I say to people, why are you here? They say, well, I want to be able to help my pet in need, but I also want to be able to save money on vet bills. I don't want to feel like I have to rush off to the vet for absolutely everything that happens. And you know what? That's not unreasonable because once you have a background on what is serious and what isn't, then you know what you can handle on your own and when you need to get that interaction. There's also a maintenance type of idea, and you sort of touched on it with prevention, but in some ways, like if your animal gets a little nick on its paw and you've taken this course, you're going to know that you're supposed to be checking your dogs and cats all the time and touching every part of them and looking at them, especially when you come home from walks. And so you're more likely to catch it when it's new and not yet infected. You're more likely to shave around the area and clean it out and put the stuff on that you're supposed to and watch it over a couple days. And most likely, that'll be the end of it. If you haven't taken this course and you don't know what to look for, you don't realize that a paw that feels hotter is actually a sign there's a problem, for example, or you don't know how to spot that your dog has a tiny, tiny, tiny limp that you really wouldn't have looked for until you took the course, this kind of thing, then you won't know that. And so the dog will keep walking on and walking on and walking, get ground in dirt and hair and grime, and a week later, you'll be at the vet, and they'll be cutting it open, stitching it up, putting the dog on antibiotics, putting a cone collar on him, maybe a tube, depending on how infected it got, and on and on and on. Now you've got a serious problem, a few hundred dollars, when before it was just a little, little first aid kit situation. And that's the kind of thing that is different with kids and, and dogs, because your kid screams and cries and shows you his owie, and he doesn't, it's not all covered in fur. Your dog doesn't do that. In fact, cats especially, they hide their pain. So you have to know what to look for. Exactly. You're right, and I think another um, thing that we cover in our course that people are not aware of is human medication. There's a lot of human medications that people use on animals that are safe, but there's just as many, if not more, that are not safe. So just being aware of not only what to do, but whether or not to give the medication and what kind of medication. That's so true. I've seen people even sent here, you know, with, oh, please give my dog this. And they'll say aspirin or Tylenol or something that the dog really ought not to have. And, and they'll say, just give it this if it seems stiff. And I'll call them right away and say, no, I'm calling your vet and I want to know what the proper drug is supposed to be because this is not right. Oh, well, I just, it seems to work. Yep, it seems to work. But you're giving your dog something that's toxic to his system when he's ill already. Why are you doing that? You know, let's get the right medicine because it's probably just as cheap. There's not, you know, and as you can tell from the commercials to the show, there's a 1-800 pet med ad there. There are ways of getting your drugs cheaper. If cost is the problem, if you go to your vet and you get a prescription and it seems like a lot to fill right there, ask him for the paper script and take it where you fill your own drugs. Take it to the big box store or call 1-800 pet meds because Cost shouldn't stop you from getting the right stuff for your pets. It can be really, really cheap. They even have delivery and all kinds of stuff and bonus offers. And if you press the number for the show, you get even more of a discount, you know, all kinds of stuff. So if cost is an issue, then, then go there because there's no reason you should be giving your dog no meds or the wrong meds or having your dog or cat in pain just because of, you know, the fact that the vet, rightly so, takes advantage of the fact that some people would rather have the ease of getting their pills and medicine right there. And they pay for that. And the vet needs people like that. But if you're not one of those people, <laughs> let him know. He won't mind. He doesn't want your animal in pain. So, okay. So let's talk a little bit more about this course because we're quickly running to the end of this show. Well, if someone takes the course, you talked a little bit about what they learn. It's how many hours is it? It's a 10-hour course. Most of our instructors offer the course over a one full day format or split over two days, but we do have some instructors that offer night classes, so you'll go for four or five evenings, either for two or three hours, and that way you can fit it into your work week without having to give up your weekends. Okay. And to become an instructor? The instructor course runs over a weekend. It's about 14 hours. There's some pre-course work that's required to prepare uh, and then after the instructor course, the instructor candidate has to do what's called a co-teach. So they go into a class with an experienced instructor and they teach it together just to make sure that that uh, new instructor is ready. So what's special about Walks and Wags program? Because I know it's very different. It is. It's, there are a number of uh, pet first aid programs available on the market. I think one of the, the largest things that makes us different in our programs, you already mentioned, which is we allow live pets into our classes so that it's, it's more realistic. 
Uh, mm-hmm. Our course is also the longest course available, and it allow, because we have the full 10 hours, it allows us to present just so much more information to the participants. The preventative and early detection component of our course is absolutely key to the day-to-day health of pets. You know, an emergency might happen once a year, but your pet's life also is there every other day of the year. So that's one of the the key factors as well, that we really try to keep pets healthy and avoid emergencies. You know, I went on your website and I was looking at when it's offered and where it's offered, and I couldn't help but notice how it's offered in so many vet clinics. And I'm thinking, well, if there's anybody who doesn't need this, it's a veterinarian and his veterinary nursing staff, but then... I started to think, well, I guess they do need this. And I guess the answer is because stuff doesn't happen in the clinic, does it? Emergencies don't happen at the hospital very much. That's true. And also the front end staff in vet clinics often go to school and take veterinary office assistant programs. And many of those programs don't cover first aid. They cover how to work the front end. And so the staff in the front end want to be able to have the emergency skills in case, you know, that that's out for lunch and somebody comes in or when they're out with their own uh, pets out in the world. Right. Okay. I get that. What's the best part of this for you? The best part of it for me is how elite this program is. Every time I run a course, at the end of the class, I look at my participants and I think, you are a very elite group of people. If I walk the streets of my city, I could, you know, look at 150 people and I bet none of them have pet first aid. So if I put 10, 12, 14 people through class, I've just dispersed those people to all different pockets of my city and I know that if there's a pet emergency that they're going to be available. And I love that. I love that people take this program when it's, it's not, you know, most people don't even have human first aid, let alone pet first aid. And I love that this elite group of people is so passionate about animals and animal health and well-being that they will come to somebody like myself or one of our instructors to learn about it. You know what I want to do? I talked earlier in the show about hooking you up with the pet match people, but I want even more to hook you up with Charlie Crosby from Noah's Pet Wish. Do you know those people, Noah's Wish? They go in when there's flood or earthquake or fire, anything like that, all over North America. They go in and save the animals. That's all Mm -hmm. they do. They were in Katrina. They were in the Okanagan fires. They've been in Canada already this year. They've been in the States already this year. They're out there putting up their mash tents and flying in their people and getting within, I think it's 72 hours, they're set up with, uh, you know, ability to, to house and feed and water and do triage and first aid and vet care to all the animals afflicted by the disaster. So I'm thinking this has got, you've got to have some link with you. There's got to be a way that your grads should sign up for this. There's going to be the people they need the most, you know, and and they offer training courses all over North America also on a kind of rotation. And then they call you when the disaster strikes near you and see if you're willing to to come out. But it's the kind of, I mean, it's like the stuff we dream of as kids, you know, going to the emergency and being the superhero who saves the animals. I mean, it's for the right person, this is the way to go, right? I mean, it could be so good for your grads. I think that is a fabulous idea. Right now, I've been working together with an organization called World Vets, mm-hmm. and they go around the world. Uh, they were just there uh, in Japan to assist with oh, nice. uh, pets after the earthquake. And so they go around the world and do different health care programs like that as well. And I just signed up to go on a mission to Guatemala in the fall with them. So I'm really excited about oh, that. Wow. Um, I would oh, will you come to, back and more. talk to me? Will you come back and talk to me after sure. that and tell me how it, or even from there, if you can, I don't know if they'll have Skype, probably not, or phone out. Maybe we'll wait till you get back and you can tell me how it went. Ah, oh, that's so cool. Yeah, for sure. It's a stay and neuter program in a couple of different cities in Guatemala. Because that's essential. In areas where it's not practiced, the populations overrun themselves, and then there's huge amounts of first aid or care required that needn't be there in the first place if everybody was just spayed and neutered and holding their own position and not increasing the numbers. So that's going to help so much. I can't wait to hear back from you then. Okay, well, it's been a great Great show. The party's almost over. I want people to know they can find out about Walks and Wags Pet First Aid, walksandwags.com. That's walks and wags, walks and wags, W-A-L-K-S-N-W-A-G-S.com. And we'll post up all kinds of stuff with this show so you can find it and sign up or figure out how to do it long distance. Or Because I think there's going to be people 
all over North America are going to think, you know what, I could do this. This could be a job for me. I could find a place to, to do this. I could find a classroom space and I could sign up students and I could offer this. And I think about it like a franchise situation where every place this starts is like a circle, you know, an orbit around it of people who can care for animals and people who have animal first aid. And unlike when you set up a fast food chain and there's a circle around it of unhealthy people who are eating too much fast food, this, everywhere it goes, will improve the quality of life for pets. And not just the pets owned by those people, because when you're in a situation at the park or something goes wrong, you're going to meet those people. They're going to say, can I help you? I have pet first aid. And like me, when something happens anywhere where I am with an animal in distress, I'm usually there before the owner. Because you're ready for it, you're trained for it, you're used to it, you're, you recognize the signs. And, and when everybody else is moving in slow motion, it sure does help know what you're doing. And you say, Lisa? Yes, and thank you so much for seeing so much value in our program, Deborah. It's wonderful. Oh, thanks for coming on. I can't wait to hear back from Guatemala. I wish you could take me with you. Okay, well, we'll tune in with Lisa when she comes back from Guatemala and doing good pet first aid work there. Check her out at Walks and Wags, everybody. Until next time, this has been Animal Party on Pet Life Radio with your host, Deborah Wolf. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.